Honorable Senators, I rise today to speak on Bill C-59, an act respecting national security matters. Before I begin, I would like to thank Senator Gold for his informative speech as the bill sponsor. Which summarize, his speech summarized the changes that Bill C-59 will be making to our national security system. I believe that the goals and objectives of this bill, as Senator Gold outlined it, are important. When Bill C-51, the Anti-Terrorism Act, was passed in 2015, many people spoke out against how it undermined the balance between our security and our rights. Instead of keeping us safe, many of the Anti-Terrorism Act made many Canadians fear the national security agencies that should be protecting us, especially since they were given the power to violate our fundamental rights with little accountability. For minority communities, this fear was amplified. After Bill C-51 was passed, I received countless calls and emails from Canadians who were worried that CSIS would unfairly label them <coughs> as extremists and target them, and it is not hard to see why. Between CSIS's disruption powers under what many call charter breach warrants and the lack of accountability mechanism for these new powers, many believed that CSIS could now act with near impunity. Something needed to be done, and Bill C-59 shows that our government is trying to right this wrong. Honorable Senators, as we study this bill, we have to ask ourselves, does the text of the bill match its spirit and goals? As Senators in the Chamber of second, Sober Second Thought, this is one of the most important questions that we can ask. If a bill has loopholes that undermine its purpose or has provisions that go against its spirit, we Senators have the power to bring it back to its intended purpose. The reason I'm speaking today is that I do not build believe that Bill C-59 completely matches its goals of undoing the harm done by the Anti-Terrorism Act. Instead, the current form of the bill leaves serious loopholes that leave our rights vulnerable. While I would like to cover each of the problems that I found with Bill C-59, I could not, cannot do this in 15 minutes that I have today. The bill is 160 pages long, and I'm certain that many of you will be speaking on issues that you found Un, uh, of concern in this bill. So instead, I will use my time to speak about two parts of C-59, which I believe are pretty, particularly problematic. The first of these issues deals with the part of CSIS disruption powers that is commonly known as the Charter Breach Warrants. Simply put, under the Anti-Terrorism Act, if CSIS uses, wishes to use its disruption powers in a way that could violate a Canadian charter rights, they need to apply for a warrant to do so. The fact that these kinds of warrants exist is already worrisome, especially since these warrants are given to CSIS through closed proceedings. This means that CSIS agent could be given the power, power to violate our rights and we would never know about it. In fact, we would not even have a special advocate at the proceedings to argue for the protection of our rights. While many of us have called for C-59 to limit these charter breach warrants, both CSIS and the government have insisted that they are necessary to preserve our national security. The second major problem with Bill C-59 can be found in its definition of publicly available information and publicly available data sets that the Communication Security Establishment and the Canadian Security Intelligence Service will, will be able to gather and retain. At first glance, this provision may seem harmless. However, what is considered publicly av available may surprise you. For example, if hacked information is put online, that information is considered publicly available. If you have an account on any website and the website is hacked, any information that goes online is considered publicly available and can be gathered and retained. In other words, online ba banking information your credit card information from online shopping or your emails could be all be at risk. Any information that be, can be purchased or subscribed to by the public also falls under this category. In other words, the massive amounts of information that companies like Facebook uh, sell, like facial imagery, posts, photos, videos, relationships, and location data could very easily qualify under this definition. 
Worse yet, websites like web Facebook often allow apps to collect information about users and their friends. Unlike fa Facebook, there is little stopping these apps from selling that information without consequences, and thus making that information publicly available. Finally, if information was public at any point in time, it can be retained. In other words, if you accidentally post something and erase it soon after, the CSC or CSIS could retain it. This overly broad definition worries me, and I'm, I'm far from the only person to be concerned about it. When Bill C-59 went to the committee stage in the other place, the Privacy Commissioner submitted a letter where this was listed second among all his concerns about the legal standards created by the bill. In fact, Commissioner Theron even created two recommendations on the subject, which I would like to share today so that we can consider it as this bill goes on to committee stage. First, Commissioner Theron recommended that measure, measures related to the gathering of publicly available information should be limited to what is reasonable and proportional, and that they consider potential effects on the privacy of Canadians. Second, he recommended that the definition of publicly available information should be changed to specify information that was legally obtained. Neither of these changes were adopted in the other place. Instead, they only changed the definition of publicly available to prevent the CSE from gathering information where Canadians have, and I quote, reasonable expectation of privacy, end of quote. While this may seem like a good change at first glance, this change has two massive loopholes. First, what we consider to be reasonable expectation of privacy is just as vague as the definition for publicly available. In fact, Canadians surrender their reasonable expectation of privacy almost constantly without realizing it. realizing it. When you agree to give information on sites, Facebook in the long term, and services that almost no one reads, you are sur surrendering your reasonable expectation of privacy. If you send something through a courier service, you are surrendering your reasonable expectation of privacy to that service. If you send an email through a work account, you have surrendered your reasonable expectation of privacy to them. Simply put, a reasonable expectation of privacy is hardly a protection for Canadians at all. Worse yet, this change does nothing to change the definition for CSIS, which can still gather publicly available data sets since it only affects CSE. In fact, this is even more worrisome since CSIS mandate allows it to target Canadians, unlike CSE. And so even with these changes, publicly available information and data sets is still a big, pro a big problem, as big a problem as ever. Between the way the charter breach warrants are being handled and the new power to access publicly available information and data sets, I'm seeing a worrisome trend in Bill C-59. While this bill should solve the problems found in the Anti-Terrorism Act and protect the rights of Canadians, large hoop loopholes still leave Canadians vulnerable to having their rights violated. This brings me back to the question I asked when I first started speaking. Does the te text of Bill C-59 match? Currently, I believe the answer to that question is no. I do not believe that the loopholes which jeopardize Canadians' charter rights were part of government's goal when they drafted Bill C-59. To quote Prime Minister Trudeau, the goal is, and I quote, repeal the prob problematic elements of Bill C-51 and introduce new legislation that better balances our collective security <coughs> with our rights and freedoms, end of quote. However, the answer to that question does not have to remain as a no. Honorable Senators, it is for this reason that I urge you to consider the problematic sections of Bill C-59 when it goes to com committee. Honorable Senators, I, when I first came to the Senate, in 2011, I was sworn in a one week after 9-11 in 2001. And at that time, we, we were studying the anti-terrorism bill. And I can tell you, it was not a very pleasant experience to have just come as the first Muslim senator and to have an anti-terrorism bill studied with a lot of uh, finger pointing to the Muslim community. Whenever I go to mosque, people come to me and say, what shall I do? CSIS is knocking at my door. I am not an extremist. And I always tell them, answer the questions and you will be fine. 
But the fear that is created in the community is not healthy for us Canadians. And so I ask senators that we are all here to make sure that the charter rights of all, and I mean all Canadians, are protected. That is our first job as senators. We are also here to protect the rights of minorities. I can tell you, with the terrorist bills, the minorities live in fear of CSIS, and many tell me that they no longer feel safe in our great country. Our job as senators is to make sure that the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms is not breached. And so I humbly ask you that when we are studying Bill C-59, we make sure that everyone in our community feels safe. Thank you very much.